Thank you, uh, Steve, and everybody else who organized this meeting for the opportunity to be here. Uh, I face you with some trepidation, I must say, and it was interesting to follow the discussion, uh, <clears throat> follow, have this presentation follow Pietro's uh, talk, and I'd certainly like to add a bit to the debate there. Anyway, I'm going to uh, run you through a number of different sort of sections, if you like, to the paper, to my presentation, starting off with some simple geography, uh, some ideas on perspe perspectives in each country, uh, on the whole Okavango system, uh, describe to you some changing circumstances in Angola, and then leave you with perhaps some ideas uh, for the future. So uh, quite a lot of the discussion that we hear, not here, not in this room, but one hears, uh, essentially uh, is difficult, is becomes untenable because it kind of flouts some simple ge geography. And I just want to run you through some of the the simple geographical realities, not fake news, but proper news, uh, about how, what the basin looks like. Firstly, as I'm sure you all know, rainfall is much higher than in the, <clears throat> than in the south in the delta by an order of magnitude, uh, <clears throat> about twofold. Uh, altitudes are much higher uh, in, the, uh, in the north than in the south. Uh, those in the Kubangu, uh, the Kubangu, uh, the Western Kubangu catchment that Pietro has been talking about recently are a little bit higher than those in... Can everybody hear me without this gadget? Yeah, yeah, okay. Don't worry about okay, it. Okay, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> a bit higher, a couple of hundred meters on average, higher than in the, the water tower of the Quito uh, catchment. <clears throat> and, uh, and then I think this is a particularly important uh, slide to look at and that is the percentage of sand in, uh, in the topsoil. And what you'll notice is that in the Quito catchment and in this whole so-called water tower area, there's considerably more sand uh, than in the western catchment area here where the, the, the soils are generally a mix of, uh, of arena soils and feral soils with some underlying uh, geology, uh, some underlying hard rock. Uh, but there's, I think, a lot of the differences that uh, between the two, the hydrology between the two catchments and Piotr's point about groundwater being more, uh, more important, if you like, uh, is simply due to uh, these sands. And it becomes particularly, as you guys will see when you go down to Kwando, there the effect of sand really kicks in in terms of controlling the hydrology of these, of these uh, two areas. So as a result of that, and this repeats just very briefly, the, the Okavango system or the Kubango system at the top here, and the Quito system operate quite differently. Uh, the flows on the Quito system uh, have occur later than those on the Kubangu. Uh, overall, if you look at the total amount of water that each subcatchment delivers to the delta, there it's about the same. They happen at different times, and the, uh, at times the Quito's flow is higher than that of the uh, of the uh, uh, of the uh, of the Kubangu. And this again repeats some of what. Uh, uh, Piotr was talking about, this is about 55 odd years of, of river flow data, and you'll see the, the blue, the Kubangu flows, all the, you have massive changes from year to year, uh, the highs are much higher than the, the high flows of the Quito, and the lows are lower generally than the low flows of the Quito. So the Kubangu is going up and down, up and down every year, the Quito is a much steadier system, and uh, what that means, and I'll just jump in right here to the debate between Jackie and, uh, and Piotr, is that if you cut out the flows pretty well from the Kubango system, uh, you would essentially be doing away with the occasional swamps. That would be a simple way of looking at it. And it's one guy who would be really useful at this meeting even to have here is Lars Ramberg, because he really understood the productive nature, uh, I think more than anybody else, uh, the productive nature of these so-called occasional or ephemeral swamps. Uh, that's not only where, I mean, production is one word, but it's really where reproduction happens in the delta. The permanent swamps are, uh, are reservoirs where fish and other animals live and kind of lead out their lives, but the productive parts are out in the, in the occasional swamps, and the, occasional, the point that I'm really trying to make is that the occasional swamps depend on the Kubangu subcatchment. Take them away, as there are plans to do, as you know, uh, we, that would have, I think, in a very simple way, uh, a major impact on the delta. 
And then another just uh, simple geographical reality is to look at the, uh, a lot of assumptions that are made about development in the Okavango, uh, make assumptions about the, the, the availability of nutrients and, and for agriculture and so on. And just to make the point that generally, in terms of nutrients that are important for, for agriculture, for plant growth, uh, there's up in the cat, total, in, up in the upca, uh, upper catchment, uh, nutrient levels are very low here, cation exchange just as an indicator, and organic carbon uh, <clears throat> uh, on that side there. As you go down, the, go down the basin, generally nutrient levels increase as a result of uh, deposition and the flow of or the movement of, uh, of nutrients through the water, down the water uh, to the lower catchment, but overall a very nutrient poor system. And uh, I think Steve, one of the one of the, uh, the points that is often made about development and tourism in Angola is that all the wild animals are taken out by the South African Defense Force or UNITA or the Portuguese or who, whoever, uh, and certainly that happened. <clears throat> but the, uh, the system is nutrient poor and there will never be huge numbers of, of animals of the kind that you have in the Delta. Uh, that Delta supports not only because it's not really the water that's important, the water obviously is important, but it's the availability of nutrient-rich soils that produce lush vegetation for all of these herbivores to eat and all the carnivores to eat the herbivores. So the capacity for major wildlife populations in Angola is, is fairly limited. It's limited, more limited to certain areas than to others, uh, but we really do need to, uh, <clears throat> I think David Goida makes the point really clearly this is a nutrient poor system and it's highly leached uh, and there's not much that we can do about it. I think that's the take home uh, lesson. We need to live and, and, and do our planning in relation to, uh, to that. I just want to share with you, I think as you well know, the, country, the, the basin is shared between three countries. Almost all the water essentially comes from Angola, passes through Namibia and goes on to, uh, to the basin. And I live in Namibia and we, I think, I characterize our perspective as we see the water coming in at Katwitwi and we go, we see it go out at Mohembu and we think, what a waste. I mean, you know, we should just be keeping all of this water. So then, anyway, that's just a, uh, a cynical view on, on Namibia's, Namibia's perspective. But more seriously, just in a very simple way, water supply in Angola, there's a wax of water as you go downstream. Uh, so, what, and I'm talking about water generally, not just river water, <clears throat> water availability of water. So in Angola, there's lots of water, and Botswana is a more arid area. Nutrient supplies, conversely, low nutrient supplies in Angola going upwards uh, <clears throat> as you go downstream. In terms of land uses, and this is a generalization, in Angola, essentially, the basin is used mainly for smallholder farming, or there is no particular use in hunter-gatherers, uh, but really smallholder farming and then vast open areas characterize the basin area in Angola. In Namibia, a whole mix of smallholder farming, some commercial farming, big irrigation schemes, some tourism, lodges, and so on. And then in Botswana, I think it's true to say that tourism is the number one kind of land use uh, conservation is obviously an important land use in, <clears throat> in the basin in, uh, in, uh, in Botswana and then some smallholder farming as well. If we look at how, what sort of value is added to the river as you go down, essentially in Angola very little value is added to the Kubangu system. The water flows out of the country and essentially that's it. <clears throat> Namibia somewhat in between and Botswana a lot of value is added because of all this tourism and, and so on that uh, people come essentially pay to see the water. And if you look at the value of the, of the Okavango system to the overall economy of the country, the, the, uh, the river basin has relatively little value to the economy of, of Angola, somewhat in between in Namibia and high value. And if you look at the international value of the river basin in each country, again, a much steeper curve the Delta is this world famous, even the National Geographic know about it. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, it's just an order of magnitude wise. If you talk about the Okavango anywhere else in the world, people will just immediately point their finger to Botswana. They'll never point their finger to, to Angola and maybe a little bit to Namibia, but uh, they're probably there. 
So I think those are important things to bear in mind uh, in terms of what is happening in Angola. Just some observations on, on sort of policy, if you like, in relation to land and water. Essentially in the Kubangu, in, the, uh, in Angola, land is generally free, open access, uh, in a very general way. In Namibia, again, in all the countries, land is free. There's no sort of commercial freehold ownership of land on any, to any extent. Access is much more controlled in Namibia by traditional authorities. And in Botswana, access to land is much more tightly controlled through land boards and so on. Uh, much the same kind of thing for water. Uh, water's free, it's essentially help yourself in Angola, open access. Uh, and I'll describe to you some examples of, of what is happening there. Uh, in Namibia, again, the water's free, but the permitting systems for, uh, despite all the offtakes that you guys uh, observed or counted uh, going down the Kubangu, there is some sort of control. And then in, <clears throat> in, uh, in Botswana, essentially, obviously the water's free, but access is tightly controlled. So these are some important differences between the countries in terms of how they manage and how they see uh, the Okavango Basin. I'd like now just to uh, give you some ideas on what is happening more recently in Angola. Uh, and I'm going to start off with uh, showing you, making a comparison uh, between the Kuneni and, uh, and the Kubangu. And if it, <clears throat> any of you really want, I think, in my view, a very special kind of religious moment, you need to go to a place called Chikala to Holonga, which is halfway in between, halfway between Kachiyungu in the, in the east and Wambu. And on this little hill, you have four rivers. Woody, I don't know if you've been there, but you should. Anyway, this gentle hill, small town, and you have four rivers, the sources. And I know what is sources, a kind of uh, symbolic thing. But you have the sources of four rivers radiating off within a few hundred meters. So in the southeast, whoops. Uh, in the southeast of the town here, you have the Kubangu, the source of the Kubangu, you have the source of the Kuneni River, the Keve River. So these two rivers obviously go down. So this is the, the great equatorial divide. These two rivers go south. And then you have the Keve River, which goes north to Potambuit, onto the Atlantic. And the Kutatu, uh, <clears throat> not the same as the other Kutatu that comes south, uh, is a major tributary of the Kwanzaa that goes north to south of, uh, south of Luanda. The point, the real point that I want to make here is that the Kubangu and the Kuneni pretty well start in the same area and flow south, the one a bit to the west, the other one to, to the east. So if we look at what is happening on the Kubangu, there are a whole lot of interesting things. Uh, the Kuneni, I'm going to talk a bit about the Kuneni. So there it is, the source is up there, Wambu, Gove Dam, Matala, Lubangu, I think you get the geography of it all. Comes down to Rokana and then does a right turn. Oh, left turn, right turn, and then goes off to the Atlantic at the Foz de Canini. <clears throat> so over the years, uh, a whole lot of developments have happened on the Kuneni. The Kuneni has always been much more uh, densely populated and, in a sense, developed in Angola than, than, the, uh, than the Kubangu, with a whole lot of uh, big dams at Gov, Matala, at Jamba here, I missed that one, <clears throat> Jamba Miner, and uh, at Kaloek, and... and uh, and Ruakana, some fairly big uh, bulk water offtakes to, uh, to Lubango, Matala, and so on. So, in a sense, much more developed than what you, you see on the, on the eastern side in the, in the Kubangu. And so, yeah, this is more or less what, it's, uh, what the river looks like. Is it comes down to the Namibian border and then goes west. And what is important from Namibia's point of view <clears throat> is that the uh, hydroelectric steam at Ruakana produces about close to half of all of Namibia's electricity. So Namibia is highly dependent on it. This pipeline is a bulk pipeline system down here into, uh, into north central Namibia, Vambo if you like, and some of the water goes back up to Nomakundi and, and Ojiva. That pipeline supplies water, all the water's needs for about 40% of all Namibians. So it's a, the Kuneni is a big deal for Namibia. That's my point. It's not for a bunch of bunny huggers and tourists way off in some remote country called Botswana. It's immediate real stuff, okay? <clears throat> uh, so this is more or less what the river looks like. And what is interesting is, I think as you all know, the oil price crashed and Angola's economy depended a lot on, on or earned a lot from, from oil. And uh, so in recent years, there's been a big scheme, a big push in Angola uh, to diversify the economy. Diversifying the economy is the buzzword in Angola. 
So if you look at what was in the Kunani Basin in Angola uh, before about 2015, essentially there were six irrigation schemes and they covered about 7,000 odd hectares, 7,300 hectares. 7, hectares. <clears throat> Just in the last two years, or yeah, pretty well two years, even in the last year, some of them, uh, there are seven new uh, irrigation schemes that have been put in and two of the existing older ones have been expanded. So within a couple of years, the amount of irrigated land that has been, been allocated and, and, and plowed up and so on has increased about five times. <clears throat> uh, as a result of that, and also uh, high rates of erosion because of land degradation, essentially the Kuneni River a couple of months ago ran dry at Ruakana. So as a result of that, the movie had to buy its electricity elsewhere, spent about $9 billion over the last couple of years. <clears throat> and uh, so the consequences of, of these developments on, uh, on the flow of water is, is significant, not only for Namibia. I need to point that out. If you look at what is happening to Gove Dam, that's the, uh, that's the uh, extent of the, that's Gove Dam in, 20, in September, a couple of years ago, and a, a few months ago, that's what it looked like. This was also, I'm not saying this is all because of irrigation at all. There's some rainfall effects here, and there, but there are effects uh, as a result of high rates of erosion, high sedimentation, and, and other impacts. So the Kuneni River is changing dramatically with impacts on in, in Namibia uh, and very much uh, on Angola itself. If we look at, uh, <clears throat> at, uh, at the Kubangu system, if you like, now, uh, essentially, what we have up here are some existing developments from way back, and I'll give you the numbers just now and some new ones. I just wanted to point out that Namibia has designs from time to time on pumping water to the central part of the country. Uh, Botswana, has, I think, has inter entered into an interesting discussion with Namibia about dumping this idea and putting in a desalination scheme, which makes, <clears throat> makes much more sense. Uh, but certainly the ideas amongst the engineers remain, they would love to do some heavy pumping all the way to central Namibia. There are also ideas of pumping water out of <clears throat> pretty well uh, Nkurunkuru, westwards into Avambo to supplement the water supply there. And the Angolan government have very well developed plans, uh, unpublished, uh, to pump water from Kayundu down into the Kuvalai part of uh, <clears throat> of uh, of, uh, yeah, of Angola. So that generally just sketches some of the developments that you see. If we look at uh, the same kind of numbers that have existed, uh, I think, yeah, the main point is that the Kubango has all along been, as it's called, Terra de Fim de Mundo, the land of the end of the earth. It's always been this kind of forgotten corner or uh, uh, neglected corner of Angola. So not much has ever happened there. Before 2015, as far as I can work out, they can only find one active irrigation scheme just south of, uh, at Mazombo, just south of Manong. Uh, if you look at the amount of land that's irrigated there, it's about 300 odd hectares, so it's pretty. But just in the last few years, about five new irrigation schemes, pretty well in the last year, in fact, about five new irrigation schemes uh, have started up, and we're looking at a total area about 20 times more. Still small, of course, but, uh, but my point is that there's been a sudden rush on, uh, on getting farms and get, getting irrigated land, and I'd need to point out again that that's all for free, and the water's for free, uh, with scant environmental uh, uh, <coughs> checks and balances. Just to give you an example, you guys, when did you come down the Kubango? In August, eh? July? July. July, okay, so this is the Kubango. Here, just northwest of the town of Kuvangu. Okay, so this is on 6th of 8th of September 2016. That's what it looked like. A year later, there were 10 big center pivots, about 530 hectares put in within a year. This is entirely a private development. The government's got nothing to do with it. Uh, and it's just one example of the kind of speed with which development has, has, is happening then. What I've described to you is entirely private development and so on. If you look at a development plan for the Kubango River, the Ang Angola's official cabinet approved development plan, their idea is to put in about 200,000 hectares 
of irrigated land in, uh, in the, essentially in the Kubangu catchment, and at least four major dams that would draw off something like 2.5 uh, billion cubic meters per year, which on average is about half of what, on average, half the water that comes into Namibia at Katwitwi, and about a quarter of the water on average that goes into the delta. Of course, those percentages would be much higher in dry years. And, uh, and as I say again, uh, these, this is the government's official plans. Okay, I'm not sure and I'm not claiming that they will all be implemented, but that is the intention of the government. And there are other private developments of the kind uh, that I've mentioned uh, that have already happened and will happen. So if we look at that, just looking at the official plans of, uh, uh, of those developments in Angola, this is uh, monthly water inflow from the Kubangu at Katwitwi on average during each month from October through to September. For about four months in a year, there would be no water entering Namibia on, on average. <clears throat> In those in those months, so that's those are some of the developments that are planned and that are happening in Angola, in Namibia. Of course, we have our own designs on getting not wasting all this water. Uh, at the moment, about 2,100 hectares are, are irrigated in so-called green schemes along the Kubanga River, Akavanga River. Uh, there are plans to put in another 12,000 to pump water. Uh, to the Kuvalai in the central Namibia, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, that together, cumulatively, would take off about another 300 odd, 320 million cubic meters, which is about uh, you know, a seventh or so of what was planned, officially planned in Namibia, but still a significant amount. And I want to make the point that none of these developments can happen without massive public funding. Uh, none of these things are economically sustainable in terms of a business model or, or anything like that. So massive public funding, and generally when these economic analyses are done, it's rather like a deep hole, a day where people are pouring a lot of money and wasting a lot of water, I guess. Uh, and so, <clears throat> uh, as a result of these kinds of scenarios and these kinds of de developments, I think we can agree that not, uh, considerable water, volumes of water will or may not come to the delta, variation in flows are likely to increase. Water qualities, of course, we always, you know, the focus in all of this, unfortunately, is on just volumes of water, millions of cubic meters, but we do very little to measure or to assess the impacts of, of nutrients coming into the water supply and their impact on the veg in the, in, uh, uh, in the delta. We have, we pay no attention, essentially, to uh, the impact of pesticides that would come from agricultural schemes that might leak. And interestingly, just recently now, uh, there is the, the possible or probable uh, introduction of tilapia niloticus into the river system from a small private development uh, upstream. So it's not just volumes of water, all sorts of other things can come down uh, as well. <clears throat> I think what is interesting is and I see this especially in Namibia. You know, some guy wants 10 hectares. And he says, oh, sure, that's no, no problem. You know, 10 hectares, 10 cubes of water, no problem. But the cumulative impact of that is never assessed. Each little thing is assessed on its own, you know, within its own confines, its own merits, and it looks good, so just add it to the pile. <clears throat> and, of course, each one of these developments, big or small, lowers, cumulatively lowers the value uh, of the whole system. And each, each of these little developments, big or small, each development makes it easier for the next guy. It, it creates more and more precedent. Uh, and so the whole idea of you know, a bunch of bunny huggers like us saying, whoa, 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 you've got to keep it pristine, our argument just loses, loses uh, credibility. So these are some of the things that I think are worrying. But uh, and I'd just like to now try to end off with, uh, with some ideas. and. First of all, I want to, and I need to try to say this carefully, uh, there's a real need, I think, to, the whole Okavango system is in a big sand pit, big Kalahari Basin sand pit. Uh, the nutrients are lousy, high water leaching rates. It's just not a place to go farming. And the fact that the Portuguese left it alone way back was no accident. 
you know, it's just a bum bloody place for farming. <clears throat> but we keep on, we keep on, uh, it's like a religion. We have to, and especially in Africa, and especially for, for rural Africans, rural Africans can do nothing other than farm. That's our, our prejudiced perspective. Uh, on, and I say this very clearly from Namibia. We have a policy in Namibia, in fact, legislation, which says that rural, rural Africans in communal areas can have 20 hectares. Uh, they may not use that land for any commercial purposes, okay? And that land can only be used for crop production and for residence, okay? So by definition, any income earning opportunity is cut out. We, because of how land was divided up in those days of apartheid and so on, of course, all that really shitty land is rural African communal land where the source allows you. So we, you know, our policy and our legislation, this is post-independence, eh? way past, <clears throat> is designed to put people on the worst possible land in tiny little pockets of little farms and then expect them to just eat. No money. Don't need money because there's no commercial activity. Eh? Uh, and a lot of that thinking goes across Africa, unfortunately. <clears throat> And what I'm trying to say in a nice way is that when we look at, in the water tower area, we look at poor residents, uh, we need to think, and we think that this is can, can or should continue. I guess it can continue, but whether it should continue, I have very grave reservations. And I just want to give you, so this is uh, the Kubanga River, Sabati, the town of Sabati is about here. The Kwati River, Stefan, just to wake you up where you run. The Kwati River, where Stefan has a little plot, 20 hectares, is over there. And this is a magnificent patch of Baikia uh, forest, just west of the river. It's why it exists there. You can even Piotr on that big satellite image. This thing stands out like a, uh, a sore thumb. So this picture was taken in 1996, and you can just see these couple of little white patches there. Okay, and this picture was taken a few months ago, and you see much of this stuff this dark stuff, that color, this is still good forest. Eh? The fact that it's green is, is irrelevant. But all this little pink, white stuff down here, it's just slash and burn, a couple of years, people move in, wipe out all these beautiful Zambezi teaks, use it for a couple of years, and then move in. <clears throat> in the same area, we, all of us, we have a huge whinge about all the logging of uh, Giaborti, of uh, Sib, eh? thousands and thousands of logs are being taken out by the Chinese, we love to hate the Chinese, uh, and shipped out of the country. We say nothing about this. The impact of logging of these isolated big trees is not visible at all. We can see clearly, uh, and we know that this is just a recipe for poverty. So anyway, I'll try to say that carefully, but I hope you get the drift. Uh. <clears throat> We also, a lot of the thinking about these 210,000 hectares in Angola is based on the assumption that this is good farming country. I think we can agree, or I hope we can agree that it's not good farming country. And if you look at the general distribution of nutrients that are useful for farming, this is, this is about as bad as you can get. So I would really hope that in the discussions in the future, we can start with the Angolan governments, and I have to say that, to reevaluate this whole preoccupation with this being good farming country. Because, you know, the guys are going to go in there and they're just going to, at huge public expense, uh, if, if they were going to do it and, and earn something decent for the country, you say, okay, well, that's good. Let's let a bit of water go. Let some pesticides come down in, into Botswana. But it's not going to happen. So there's a real need to to rethink this love affair that we have with agriculture and start to think about other land uses. Oops. Okay, I like to think, <clears throat> I've said some bum things about Angola. Let me say some bum things about Botswana. I think this is Botswana's understanding of the Okavango system. There's a guy at Mohembu with a big tap. And Botswana thinks that all water that comes into the delta is from this water engineer uh, at Mohembo, I'm being facetious, but sometimes I wonder why Botswana is so little, con so uh, seemingly unconcerned about where Okavango water comes from. 
Uh, Botswana clearly earns much more from the Okavango system than anyone else, both financially, it's second to, second to diamonds in terms of contributing to GDP. It brings Botswana a massive reputation. Are we nearly done? Yeah. <clears throat> it's a big deal. But so Botswana, if the tap gets turned off, Botswana's got a lot to lose. And by definition, it has, I think, an obligation to start to pay. And I'm not talking about paying with dollars. It needs to start to find ways to spread the value of, of, uh, of the Okavango back upstream. It all flows downstream to Botswana, but Botswana has been sitting very happily uh, using that, and, uh, but now there's a way to start to, there's a need to start to share those benefits upstream and to start to pay for water, if you like, to put it bluntly. <clears throat> I uh, put this, I mentioned this yesterday in a small meeting that we have, I, I really, uh, at the moment we have a lot of people in Botswana who are very passionate about the, uh, the Delta, we have a few other people in Namibia and a few people uh, in the US elsewhere that are interested in it, but there is no, there's no group of people, there's no organized group of people that are really custodians of the basin. Uh, and I venture this suggestion to you here, a need to, uh, to create some sort of Okavango society, for want of a better word. Steve uh, has in mind uh, Okavango Watershed Trust. I'm not so sure about the watershed word, but anyway. Uh, <clears throat> but there's, there's a need for some sort of body of people, passionate people, to promote the interests of the basin in the broader sense of the word. I think that organization should be monitoring water flows and water qualities because it's not done across the basin. Uh, and they should be monitoring developments. These little satellite images that I showed you earlier, that's just me fiddling around in the middle of the night looking at, at satellite images and saying, whoa, sure, there's a new development here, a new development there. This has got to happen systematically. Most of the developments that I showed you on the Kuneni River are not known to the government in Luanda. I've tested, I've taken the pictures to Luanda, shown the people there, I said, Who, who's it? No, we don't know. And there is a permanent joint technical commission uh, that looks after the interests of the Kuneni between Namibia. Those guys don't know about these developments. So somebody's got to be monitoring these developments, and that needs to start really soon. <clears throat> I mentioned earlier, I mean, if you type in Okavango Delta, you get a million hits on Google. You type in Okavango Basin, you get 20 or whatever. Exaggerating. There's a real need to start to s promote the identity of the Okavango Basin. We all know about the Okavango Delta. We need to know about the Okavango Basin. And then I just want to leave you, this is my final slide, to leave you with this pretty picture which shows the Quido River coming in here. Uh, and these fantastic scroll bars. And this is the Kubangu River coming in here. Steve, I said this uh, to you a couple of times. I just really hope that the, the Kubangu catchment is not terribly sexy, let's be clear. It's pretty bugger. But somebody needs to look after it. If that doesn't get looked after, then the production and the reproduction that you see in the delta is really going to... Uh, Jackie, I'm afraid I'm, I'm uh, on the other side of this one. Uh, but this, this flow of a lifeline, this flow of reproduction, let's call it that, okay? Uh, that really needs some serious uh, attention. So I'll leave you with that. Thanks. Thank you.